Let me start recording. So today we're going to be focusing on electrochemical electrophysiology methods and I wanted to when I was planning the syllabus planning this course, I wanted to make sure to include these techniques um, here at case, especially because our biophysics department over in the medical school. Um, has quite a number of people focusing on membrane proteins uh, their structure, but also some groups doing uh, electrophysiology methods. Um, so I thought it was important to include this so you can understand what some of the research is uh, going on on our campus and what it relates to. Um, so today, while we're going over these electrochemical methods, um, these are primarily used to study membrane proteins and signals. So knowing what types of membrane proteins there are and different channels uh, and their classification is one important thing to take away from this. Um, we're going to review the relevant electrochemical terminology and a couple of equations. Um, what we mean by resting potential or uh, equilibrium potential versus action potentials and the like. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of electrophysiology methods. And these are done at different scales. So if you're interested in measuring over a tissue scale, an individual cell scale, or in getting close to individual membrane protein scales, uh, what type of techniques are best suited for that? Um, yeah. So those are, and I guess that relates to like the different sample geometries that you can use with this. Um, so with our instrument block diagram, roughly our source is going to be some applied potential. While the sample is going to be some form of membrane proteins, portion of a membrane, and these are going to be in contact with electrodes or one electrode and there's going to be a reference electrode somewhere else. And the nice thing here uh, in terms of detection, since we're working with electrons here, we can just do it's all electronics. There's not going to be pretty much all the other methods that we've been working with have been or discussing have used photons and you have to get photons to electrons to then actually be able to detect it with electronics. Here, since we're dealing with electrons themselves, we can keep the detection quite simple. Okay. So when I'm using the terms electrophysiology and electrochemistry, I mean, it's all with the electro part here, the fact that we're studying ionic currents And we're interested in where electrons or charged species are going in a sample. So I would say in terms of electrophysiology, that's going to be how more specific to, I guess, human health, the body, physiology. Um, so electrophysiology is more concerned about how does the body convert stimuli from outside sources to signals inside the body. 
So I would say a lot of this has to do with like the brain, neurons, and the like, since that's what interacts with signaling. Um, so going from the bottom up of small molecules to larger samples, um, this concerns membrane proteins, uh, cell signaling, and I guess membrane potentials. And then this can even scale to uh, if one cell receives a signal, how does it interact uh, with its neighbors as well? Which I guess would be termed systems biology. So a lot of our focus is going to be on membrane proteins, which I have an example diagram here. And are you guys aware of, or if you've taken some biology courses and the like, what are some membrane proteins or ions that you've heard of? Um, what ions are important? If you guys have, or maybe some of you guys are doing research on any of those. So if you want to throw those in the chat or on mute, yeah, we got one. Dan and Jack are saying calcium, so well, potassium, sodium, calcium. Yeah, those are some of the common players. Um, also, on smaller, less frequently, you also see chloride and proton pumps as well um, that you'll see for ion signaling. Um, so, with membrane proteins, there's different categories. of types of membrane proteins. Um, so the simplest membrane protein would be a leak channel. So this would be a membrane protein that is open at all times. But the ones that are more of interest to researchers are gated channels. So these have open close functionality. Um, and the gated channels are further subdivided based on how they're open and closed. Um, so the ones that you guys have mentioned all these different types of ions, those would be voltage gated. Um, so these would be open closed is mediated by, by changes in the membrane, poten membrane potential. That's what all these ions are related to. These are voltage gated. And it also has to do, it's worth noting that it has to do with like the local membrane potential as well. So if you have charge buildup on one area of the cell, like neurons, let's say in the synapse region, that's not gonna open up voltage gated ion channels way down at the other end of the neuron. It's gonna be somewhat local for that. Um, so that's one type of gated channel. Um, another one would be ligand gated or also called like chemical gated or these are also called ionotropic receptors. And this depends on a chemical ligand. So these chemical lig ligands are commonly neurotransmitters. So over here, this is an example of a ligand gated receptor. So and it's called AMPA, which I'm not gonna remember the full terminology for that. I'm sure that's like amine and methyl or something like that, but uh, you could look up what the acronym stands for. But here you can see a ligand in this portion and um, once a small molecule binds, binds to this ligand binding domain that causes allosteric 
um, allosteric changes. So that means something binds here, it's going to cause a structural change somewhere else far away from that ligand binding site and then open up um, uh, this channel through the transmembrane. So AMPA is a very commonly studied one. And also um, NMDA. And there's a lot of work being done on these because they are uh, in the brain. They respond to neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, um, also uh, other types of small molecules. And the degree that they open will depend on the whatever ligand is binding in there. Um, and they have a lot of role in, uh, I guess, depression, uh, mental health diseases. So that's where a lot of the research is being done uh, for these types of receptors. Um, I guess GABA is also one that you may have heard of. And then finally, the last one, it would be called mechanical gated. So these re respond to, uh, I guess, they're mechanosensitive or also stress sensitive. So stress can be things like, um, so mechano would be forces, stress might be something like heat or the like with that. And um, you'll find these, so examples, acronyms that again, I don't know that well are DEG, ENAC, ASIC, let's see, X, where this X stands for a letter. And these mechanogated ion channels, you'll see them um, in places where there's changes in forces, such as in the lung. Um, also, these are the ones that will uh, are involved in senses as well. So having a neural response after like you touch something hot or um, in your eyeball with seeing uh, and the like. So um, these are the three main classes. Realize that uh, voltage gated, ion gated, ligand gated, chemical gated. Um, there's different terminology that's used uh, for these different types of uh, membrane proteins. Um, so that's an introdu introduction to membrane pr proteins, what electrophysiology is. And we also need to be aware of some of the terms of describing the function of these membrane proteins as well. And when a potential changes, um, what are the terms that are used? Um, so first we're gonna focus on like the electrophysiology terms. I would say at the cell level. and specifically related to potential changes. So with many of these methods, that's what you're measuring, the potential change as, ion, as membrane proteins open and close for changes in the uptake of different ions. Um, so when you're taking an initial measurement at equilibrium, this is called the resting membrane potential. So this is at equilibrium. And based on like potassium pumps and the concentration of potassium, uh, extracellular versus intracellular, um, this potential is always negative. Um, And you can see this table here, we'll talk about it in more detail in a little bit, but here's the potassium concentration versus intracellular versus extracellular concentrations there. Um, so with these negative potentials, these will depend what the uh, resting membrane potential is, will depend on the type of cell. So if you have an excitable cell, meaning a cell that you want to respond to changes in potential, these have a large, highly negative um, resting membrane potential. And these are measured in millivolts. So 
what types of cells uh, would you think would need to have to have a fast response or a fast change um, in the body? You guys have any ideas of which ones would need, are involved in physiological processes that you would need to have a fast response? You can throw it in the chat, unmute. Yeah, so Catherine says neurons, I'd say that's one type. Any other ideas? You can think of movement or fast twitch muscles. Um, I guess I gave that away. Fast twitch response was what I wanted to say. So the other one I would say are muscle cells. Skeletal muscle cells specifically. Um, so for neurons, these have the resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts. Um, for muscle cell, okay, I'm writing that in the wrong space, Seven, negative 70 millivolts. For muscle cells, that's going to be uh, negative 95 millivolts. Um, also for senses, so if you have photoreceptor cells in your eye, those have a negative 40 millivolt. So you can see on the order of tens of millivolts for excitable cells. Um, so non-excitable cells, ones that don't need to have a fast response, these will have lower uh, resting potentials. Um, so any ideas of types of cells or tissues that would, you would classify as non-excitable? Leukocytes. Which would be a good one. So any other ideas? I know we've been focusing more on the molecular side of things. I'm having you guys think more of, uh, I guess, in the medical sense. And we'll get into the different cell types next week as well. Yeah, mature bone, that would be a good one. Some of the other numbers that I got were for like cartilage. Cells would be negative eight millivolts. I also got like red blood cells, where you'll see this commonly RBCs. Those have negative 8.4 millivolts. So typically for non-excitable cells, they range from negative five to negative 10 millivolts. Um, so in the problem set, there's a question about, I guess, neurons. You're going to have to have an idea of like what the resting membrane potential is uh, for that. Um, so this will, it's good to know like what is your cell type? What is that resting membrane potential when you're doing measurements? Um, and when you are doing measurements and you want to see the response, uh, you then also want to work with the action potential. So this is going to be the change that you observe. Due to some stimuli by, uh, you can introduce a drug, you can introduce different ions, and then have those, mem just like with the different classes of membrane proteins we were discussing, you can add a force to it, you can add a ligand, um, and then you observe the change in the membrane potential during your measurements. Um, so this is what you call the action potential is that change. And this can either be depolarization um, or repolarization. This change. So these terms have to do with what direction do you see the change? So depolarization means a change um, towards a potential of zero. While repolarization is a shift in voltage away from zero. And when you're doing your measurement, you might be on the positive side or on the negative side 
of zero when you're measuring the potential. So these terms will be, uh, that's why they're uh, termed relative to that zero value. So it could be more positive or it could be more negative in, during repolarization depending on your measurement. Um, and that depends, so that direction, negative or positive shift depends on like what ion that you're measuring um, with your electrodes. So you can see here, focus on like, okay, what the intracellular concentration, extracellular concentration is what you're measuring. And that will determine, okay, are you measuring positive values or negative values? And again, in the problem set, it's gonna be asking about, are you gonna have a negative or positive measurement? Which direction does the electric field point across that membrane based on the concentrations that you're monitoring? Um, so this table should help you uh, determine that out. I think it's focusing on the sodium um, since it's related to neurons with that question. Um, I also want to note that depolarization, since we are, this is a physics course, that depolarization and electronics, you'll hear that one. It's like in physics, depolarization means equaling zero volts. Here in terms of neuroscience or electrophysiology, depolarization is defined differently. It's towards zero. It's not reaching absolute zero. So be aware that those terms are different in biophysics uh, versus in more classical physics electronics. So, um, and also, getting more into the electrochemical terms. We can't talk about electrochemistry without mentioning the Nernst equation um, that relates the voltage that you measure based on the concentrations of what is present. So I'm gonna write this more uh, specifically for doing a measurement across a membrane. So the Nernst equation here would be the voltage, the potential that you measure across the membrane is related to gas constant times the temperature over your ionic charge of the species that you're measuring times Faraday's constant. Um, so Faraday's constant is a measure of the electric charge in terms of moles. So just as a reminder, that's 96,485 coulombs per mole and is the ionic charge. So this constant out here is then multiplied times the natural log of your the concentrations of your ionic species outside the membrane over the concentration inside the cell that you're measuring. So that's a relevant equation for any electrochemistry um, measurements. Okay, so to provide some figures related to when you're doing a measurement and these types of terms, I've shown here over on the left hand side, um, this would be a typical measurement. We're going to talk about the equipment that you use to take those measurements. Where here, this is a neuron measurement, so we're at negative 70 millivolts. You then introduce some ions to change the potential and you can see that this would then be depolarization as this is shifting towards, towards a value of zero millivolts. So the stimulus will probably, looks like it was applied right here. You'd see the degree of change. You turn it off, it relax back, relaxes back down. So this little shift here would also be a repolar, this would be repolarization, this decay here. So I guess I disagree with this figure a little bit. So this portion here is repolarization. And then you can see here, they call it hyperpolarization or repolarization as well. And this portion here I would call depolarization. So this is a very general figure, but these times of repolarization and depolarization at before and after the stimulus is turned off, that's a common measurement, common way to quantify what's going on. Um, 
And with the shape of these curves, um, I'd also assume that this would be a measurement where you're measuring over multiple membrane proteins since we're not seeing like a stochastic or a single jump. Um, and we'll talk about the different ways in a couple slides. Um, and again, the, this is more of a general uh, example of thinking about, okay, where are the ions present? And after you introduce a stimulant um, that you see sodium enter across that membrane um, from, and thinking about diffusion and uh, concentration gradients. And thinking of high to low. So back to your gen chem of thinking about diffusion for ions here. Okay, with all the terminology, is there any questions at this point? So now we're going to get into the instrumentation um, a little bit. So So the, I guess the easiest, I guess we're going in terms of, we're going in the order of the historical development of doing electrophysiology measurements. Um, so this would be, the voltage clamp was historically like the first tool that was developed um, to do electrophysiology measurements. Um, it was developed in 1947 by Kenneth Cole, uh, who I guess is one of the, when I was, Reading about the history, one of the fathers of biophysics, he was one of the early scientists to develop, um, to apply physical methods, things you would think of physics related to biology. Um, and he actually has some local connection. He went to Oberlin College, which I guess is around 45 minutes away or so um, from Cleveland, uh, where he got his undergrad degree. And uh, the voltage clamp um, uses electrodes that are placed in a cell. So this is a general uh, diagram down here, which I'll describe in more detail, but uh, let's first write out the ideas. So one electro electrode is in the cell. You can see this guy over here. And you're measuring that compared to um, an electrode in the extracellular space. And this then creates a feedback circuit. So you can see here's the, so this is one electrode and then a second electrode. And this extracellular electrode, this is commonly done uh, in vitro, so you'll have one cell, and then you'll have an extracellular bath. This isn't uh, typically done. Um, I guess it can be done in vivo, but the first initial measurements were done um, in vitro, where there's just a cell in a petri dish or so. Um, and with this feedback circuit and using electrodes, it's based on the fact that you have to have currents. Um, applied to the cell must be equal and opposite. Um, to the current going across the membrane. At a set voltage. So you can see here, that's the important thing. This is your detection that you have a current monitor present. And um, so then while you're monitoring these currents, so I guess this is your source of applying a potential, you fix that potential and you monitor the current. Um, you can then change the membrane potential uh, to then have an understanding of what's going on across the membrane. Um, these can be uh, 
rather weak uh, responses. So that's why you have a feedback amplifier here present. And with the sample, uh, this traditionally was initially developed and then used quite frequently with a giant squid axon. I guess the traditional sample here. Do you guys have any ideas about why a giant squid axon would be used uh, historically with this technique? Type it in the chat. Any ideas why the giant squid axon will be used for the voltage claim? It's right in the name. Yeah, giant. So it's just a very large neuron. So you can think when they're developing this technique, trying to introduce an electrode into the cell um, made it quite easy. So it needs to just pass through one part of the membrane. You don't want to pierce it all the way through. So, I mean, you're trying to control this to, if you're using a traditional cell, that's going to be like 10 microns, a little difficult to introduce an electrode um, with that fine of tunability. Um, it's also worth noting that this, this technique played an important role in developing the um, <clears throat> Hodgkin-Huxley model. Uh, for action potentials. So this is a very nice example of biophysics, I think. So they developed a circuit model for how neurons work. And using ideas of uh, from electronic theory, they developed a set of differential equations to then describe um, the neuron response and quantify that. So they won the 1963 Nobel Prize for that. So um, voltage clamp played a key role. And I just wanted to show here that this is in this bottom right figure, this is an example of some of the data. So I would say this is your source uh, where you're using a signal generator and that uh, membrane potential amplifier to then uh, in introduce these square wave pulses to the potential. So you can see each of the colors here with your signal pulse was then monitored looking at the potential. Um, then you monitor here. This is then monitoring the current change. You can see, like I mentioned when we talked about nanopores, uh, that electrochemistry and electrophysiology measurements, they typically have scale bars for instead of axes labels. So the height here is nanoamps per nanofarad. And then the time scale here is 40 milliseconds. So for each of these square wave pulses, they monitor the change in the current um, where the color corresponds to this. And then they plotted the degree in the change um, here where uh, this Q of B is the charge movement movement based on the potential that you applied and they get this sigmoidal shape curve. And then they use this equation, which is Boltzmann based to then get uh, thermodynamic information about how this relates to uh, the charges that are moving across the membrane, the number of charges uh, and based on that temperature. So this is one way that the voltage clamp is used. You can get thermodynamic information about uh, the signals passing through a membrane here. So example data set. Okay, any questions about the voltage clamp at all? Voltage clamp is nice, uh, but 
you are limited to measuring larger cells and you're measuring the change over the entire cell. So to get more specific, a more recent technique and a more selective technique is the patch clamp. So this was developed in the late 1970s, early 1980s by two German scientists, um, Erwin Neher. and Bert Sachman. And they won the 1991 Nobel Prize in Medicine. And it's worth noting on the previous slide that also the Nobel Prize for the Hodgkin-Huxley model was also in physiology and medicine. Um, so the other Nobel Prizes we've talked about for like the electron microscope, for AFM, for those were physics, NMR, I think had physics and chemistry, fluorescence microscopy was in chemistry. Here as we're getting to the, later into this semester, you'll see that more things are coming up that are related to the physiology and medicine um, prize. So that's the cool thing about biophysics, it spans that interdisciplinary, it spans the different fields and you see that show up with the Nobel Prizes as well. Um, so then their prize was for the, the discoveries concerning the function of single ion channels in cells. So even with that award, you see that the patch clamp is more sensitive. Um, so instead of using a large electrode that's used in the voltage clamp, the patch clamp is gonna use a micropipette. That's a key thing with the uh, patch clamp. So the micropipettes um, can then clamp to a cell membrane. Or a portion of a membrane. So if it's with a portion of a membrane, the membrane forms a very tight seal with the edge of the micropipette. And you'll hear this referred to as a giga ohm seal. So that's very important that you're only with that seal. There's no way for ions or whatever charged species that you're detecting to get through um, to where the electrode is um, uh, with that portion of membrane. And that's achieved with a vacuum. So you can see here. This is the stuff we're talking about that this micro pipette is gonna have an opening of, I mean, the micro aspect of here, ones to tens, I'd say once to hundreds of microns, depending like how selective do you wanna be that opening of the micro pipette determines your selectivity. Um, so then with this micro pipette to actually do your electrochemical measurements, you have to have it filled with electrolyte. And an electrode is present. Um, then very similar to the voltage clamp, you'll have a reference electrode outside of the cell. Um, so the, how you then do your measurement, if you want to look at a perturbation, you can vary the electrolyte or a reference bath to have, let's say, a ligand present, ion concentrations, et cetera, et cetera. So then you can have... Um, do your measurement. Also, the electrolyte oftentimes has um, solutions that are very similar to the cytoplasm. Um, so then you have, your measurement is gonna be very similar to like what's inside the cell where you're measuring that. Um, 
So then you can then do your measurement with this diagram here. This is the most simple setup that you can see that then uh, just like with the voltage clamp measurement, you can then have vary your potential or you can also vary your and monitor the current or you can vary, vary the current monitor uh, the voltage. So these two forms are then called voltage clamped where you have fixed voltage, monitor your current or you can have current clamped fixed current monitor the voltage. So those that you guys that took is 204, 208. I think in the first lab, there's a measurement with the current source with the HP instrument where you pass a, you either fix a voltage or fix a current and monitor the other one through a resistor. So that's an interesting thing of all these biophysical techniques that uh, like electrophysiology and electrochemical techniques have a lot of analogies to the electronics that you see in physics. Um, so this is a common, <clears throat> this is an example of the data that's type of, that's collected, very similar to what we were showing on this slide, you're monitoring some potential versus time or some current change versus time, depending on what format that you're measuring this. So here, this would be um, a voltage clamped experiment where you're monitoring the current versus time. But you can see that you have much more discrete steps here. Um, this is showing the selectivity that I guess here, you might think that you have, it might be possible that you have a single membrane protein. Question mark versus here where you have this sloped response or here where you have a sloped response, you're probably monitoring many different ion channels at once. So this is getting back to the motivations when we talked about single molecule techniques um, that you can resolve some of that heterogeneity that's obscured when you have these sloping signals. Here, due to many membrane proteins, many channels responding at once versus more discrete responses when you're only monitoring a couple or a single membrane protein here. Um, it's worth noting that there's many different arrangements that you can have for the patch clap experiments, depending on if you're measuring an entire cell if, or how you're, uh, what geometry the membrane protein is. So this figure is a little strange. Um, so I'll walk you through it first. That, okay, you have your micro pipette. There's some vacuum. You can see there's mild suction once you have it in contact with the cell membrane. And if that mild suction creates that tight contact, that giga ohm seal that you have there. So if you keep your micro pipette right next to the cell membrane, um, and you can even remove the entire membrane protein, here you can get the response of the entire cell. So this is whole cell recording if you're removing the mem membrane protein by doing a strong pulse of suction. So when you're doing this measurement, you're gonna be looking at the responses of all of the membrane proteins at once. So that's called whole cell recording versus if you don't remove that membrane protein, this would be cell attached recording, but you're still looking at the response of a single membrane protein that is still in contact with the cell. So that's two cell type measurements. But you can also just selectively measure a membrane protein uh, and ignore the effects of the rest of the cell by detaching this uh, uh, portion of the membrane from the cell. So this would be mechanically moving your micropipette away from the cell to then uh, cause that detachment. So there's two ways that you can do this. You can keep uh, the membrane protein in the same geometry where you would have the extracellular portion exposed to the uh, inside of your micropipette and the intracellular portion is exposed to the outside re region. So this is called inside out recording. 
versus outside out recording where you would want the extracellular. So the extracellular portion is called the outside. Um, the intracellular portion is called the inside. So if you want to do the measurement of the outside, um, you then would have to uh, change solution conditions um, and disrupt that membrane that membrane geometry so you can flip the protein so it's outside out. So the extracellular domain is then accessible to the solution. And this is a nice way to use uh, the micropipette because then you can just physically move or introduce uh, the membrane to uh, two different solutions where most of the time you're interested in, okay, if a new ligand is present, you're, a large amount of focus is played on the extracellular domain of these membrane proteins. So I would say this is the most common form of doing patch clamp experiments. Um, it's worth noting that this cartoon is idealized to have only one membrane protein in the pipette tip. Commonly, uh, there's more than one protein. And there's a lot of efforts that have been done to try to reduce the number of uh, proteins that are in the micropipette. Um, so do you guys have any ideas of how people may have tried to reduce the number of proteins in the micropipette or another method that we've discussed in this class that would be, uh, would achieve monitoring less membrane proteins. So how are some possible ways you could reduce the number of proteins in the micropipette? or do an electrochemical measurement on just a single membrane protein. Any ideas? Yeah, Catherine says smaller pipettes, so that's one way. Any other ideas? Or what's the other electrochemical technique that we discussed? Let's see, maybe in September. Yeah, end of September. Do you guys remember the other electrochemical technique we discussed? So we discussed nanopores as a single molecule technique. So I guess that's a way to get a smaller opening. Um, but yeah, nanopores would have the challenge of not being able to bring into contact with a cell and select that using vacuum. Um, with smaller pipettes, I'd say most commonly people pull these pipettes themselves. You'll have like a glass capillary, you'll heat it up, you'll pull on it um, until it breaks and you'll have a small opening. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm curious if there's um, commercial vendors of these pipette tips that probably have worked on engineering smaller pipette openings. And the last way that you can reduce the number of proteins is genetically modifying your cell. To reduce the expression of membrane proteins. 
But if you're trying to do the whole cell recording or cell attached recording, I guess you wouldn't do this for whole cell recording, but for cell attached recording, if you're genetically modifying your cell to reduce this expression, you're gonna be perturbing your, your cell quite a bit. So this isn't the most ideal situation and you have to be aware of how your experimental uh, perturbations can then change uh, what you're measuring there. So to show you an example of how these instruments are set up, um, I guess this is a cartoon block diagram, but you can see that there's typically a microscope portion here. Since these are micropipettes, you are measuring cells. You have to be able to see where your, if your micropipette is in contact with the cell. So there's a, mi a microscope aspect here where you're monitoring uh, the micropipette coming into contact. Um, you can see that there's the pressure control and pump here um, to help um, have that vacuum suction to form that tight giga ohm seal. So uh, I guess this is a, these guys are for the micro pipette aspect on this left hand side. While the right hand side of this figure is then going to be your electrophysiology measurement aspect. Um, where you can perform your electronic measurements, monitor what's going on with the oscilloscope or your computer and software. And then here your, your amplifier, I guess they're missing here like the signal generator and the like, um, you have your electronics to then have the voltage and the current control present. Um, so block diagram over here on the left, here's some actual setups here on the right where you can see again, divided in the same way. The right-hand side, you have um, your electronics. The left-hand side is to then have your um, electrodes, um, your micropipettes. This is a zoomed in area of the sample stage where you can see that one side has the micropipette, the other side has um, your electrodes. And these are commonly on like micro manipulators so you can control with very fine precision or yeah, fine precision or accuracy, bringing those into contact with the cell that's present. Um, most of these instruments are home built. I did find a commercial vendor, um, Fluxion, that sells a black box type method that you can even have, um, this is I think a 32 well plate, 96 well plate, of doing these measurements um, in parallel with one another. So you can see the human hand here for scale and all this orange is printed on electronics um, for your circuitry for doing the electronic measurements. Um, this chip here is $1,600. Uh, I hope it's reusable, um, but that gives you an idea of this is just the sample portion and the black box, um, just like when you guys do your lab visits for lab discussions, you have to ask for um, a quote. I didn't ask, but I'm guessing this is going to be in the upper tens to lower hundred thousand dollars or so. And this company, it seemed like they're relatively new, maybe five years old or so. Um, so I'm guessing that they're um, targeting more pharmaceutical industry that can buy an expensive measurement to then do screening of drugs in these 96 well plates of seeing how they respond to membrane, um, how membrane proteins respond to that since uh, a lot of these are related to, like we've been talking about neurotransmitters, there's lots of different um, drug candidates for treating uh, neurological diseases with this. Um, that's a practical use here, I guess, portion. And I guess I didn't delete this text. Um, but I did want to mention, I guess I'll use my pointer here. Uh, so I did want to mention in terms of what we've been talking about, our forms of potentiometry and vol voltometry type sensing um, that the patch clamp, the voltage clamp, those are electrophysical me physiology methods, but I did want to mention it, the terminology that you'll hear from more of like the electrochemistry uh, methods of, are your electrochemical measurements, are you measuring 
the potential? Um, are you measuring the current? Um, and if that's directly proportional, it will be referred to as amperometry. So these are the terminology you'll hear uh, in electrochemistry. Um, the most simple or the most common potentiometer that you'll see around is a pH meter. Um, but these are used for biosensors. Um, uh, and you'll see a lot of analytical chemistry is focused on uh, developing biosensors. And I mean, that's a large thing today with trying to detect viruses in the air. But uh, so biosensors are typically electrochemical methods where you'll have an enzyme that your analyte here is what you're trying to detect. This enzyme will be designed to become reactive uh, with that analyte and produce electrons that are in contact with the electrode. And then you'll measure uh, the change in the potential uh, in this type of method. Um, measuring current, the most common one that I guess the everyday version would be a glucose sensor where you have an electrode that has a polycarbonate film at the tip, similar here with this pH sensitive glass membrane that's selected for hydrogen ions um, or the like. Um, glucose sensors will be selected for glucose while other sugar molecules, other proteins that are in the blood won't pass through. After it passes through that film, it'll then have a similar setup over here where that glucose will then react with glucose oxidase. It'll produce charged species that are, that are detected electrochemically. Um, and a more specific form of voltometry is cyclic voltometry, where I have an example plot here of where current is monitored versus a potential voltage. And this, I guess the signal that is fed into uh, cyclic voltammetry measurements, the voltage versus time is gonna be a triangle wave where you sweep it up and you sweep it back down and you repeat this over and over again. And you get these curves where you monitor the current where this is telling you, okay, what's reacting. It can give you, sometimes there's multiple peaks where a second peak can tell you if there's an intermediate um, and I wanted to mention cyclic voltammetry because there's, that's a hot area of neuroscience as well as doing fast scan cyclic voltammetry where you're changing the voltage versus time very fast, one megavolt per second. So 10 to the six volts per second you can change. And this will be used to look at neurons directly uh, and monitoring dopamine, serotonin, uh, doing these very fast versus time. And this fast response and monitoring this very quickly can tell you with the depolarization or repolarization, how fast can your neurons process signals? Um, and it's at biophysically relevant time scales. So this is a hot area, I would say, of electrochemistry related to, again, electrophysiology as well, since they're doing these in neurons. And there, people are even trying to do these um, in mouse models, uh, trying to do in the, doing fast scan CV in living organisms. Um, I had a friend whose PhD was called Lab on a Sheep, where they were trying to do like fast CV um, on a sheep with a little, and the sheep wore a little backpack uh, to do these measurements. So uh, it's a fun uh, type project. So that's why I had today about electrophysiology, electrochemistry methods. So. Um, if you, the last slide related to the more electrochemistry, that's going to be all in Scoo Collar and Crouch. Um, while Leek has literally, I don't know why he ignores so, so many techniques, but there is a brief discussion of that um, in chapter six. So those are some external references. So, um, so any questions? I'll see you guys on Tuesday then.